Come on, if you believe Jesus is coming soon, make some noise. You can be seated. That's what our Advent series is all about. We start a four-week series talking about the return of Jesus. In fact, you got a note sheet. Can you grab that for me and hold it up? Make sure you got it. Uh, just to make sure everybody's got one of these. So if you're watching online, uh, grab a pen and a piece of paper and take some notes along with this. We're going to study for the next four weeks Advent. Who's ever studied Advent before? Cause your hands. So if you grew up in certain religious traditions, you studied Advent. Like I didn't grow up in those traditions. I didn't know anything about Advent. So I had to kind of look it up and kind of follow the, like, what, what does Advent mean and all about it. And basically it means coming. And I came to realize that you and I live between the two bookends of two Advents. We live between the first advent, which was the birth of Christ, and Christ came the first time, and now you and I live. And then someday we believe he's coming soon to return to fix the world. So first time he came to save us, second time he's coming to save us. Both instances were about your salvation. The first one to get you forgiveness of sin, second one to fix the world so there's no more sin in it at all. Is that good news? And so we thought we should follow the system of advent a little bit and so if you've never studied Advent before, here's kind, of the, here's kind of the deal. You get a wreath and you get four candles. Some people have five. And each of these, the wreath and all the candles mean something. So the first candle is called the prophecy candle. And it, it literally, this is what we're gonna talk about tonight. We're gonna talk about the prophecy candle. So I'm gonna light that one. You can do it. Boom. So that... The prophecy candle is just about the predicting the return of Christ in the future. And we're going to talk about his return today. Uh, The wreath itself actually represents the fact that Jesus got you victory with a crown of thorns on his head. The second candle, they call it the the Bethlehem candle uh, or the humanity candle. It just means, it just represents the fact that God came to earth to become like you. That's what we're going to talk about next week, to to be with you and me. Candle three, it represents, it's called the shepherd's candle or the mission candle. And it's just about the fact that Jesus came for the last, the least, and the lost, just like that video you just saw a couple minutes ago. Aren't you glad that God came for everybody? We'll talk about that on week three, because the shepherds kind of fit that class. And then week four, we're going to talk about angels and the good news candle. We're going to talk about the gospel itself and what the angels pronounced to all the people. And then the center candle is just the center, is the candle of Christ, that our lives are called to orbit around Jesus, that we don't orbit around what we want to orbit. We just, our, our, our lives are the center of our lives, the center of our existence, is we want to worship Jesus and follow Jesus. And that's, that's what those, the, the Advent system represents. Now, tonight, we're going to talk about the prophecy candle. And here's the thing with the prophecy candle. There are over 300 prophecies in this book that talk about Jesus coming the first time. There's over 300 of them. In the first, in the first 39 books of the Bible, there's 300 prophecies saying, he's going to come to earth, here's what's going to happen. He's going to come to earth, here's what's going to happen. He's going to come to earth, this is what's going to happen. And so for years and years and years, the people of Israel, they, it was kind of like, remember when you were like waiting for summer vacation? as a kid, and you were like counting down the days, and you were like, it's only two more months of this thing, and then I could be out of school. <sighs> and then it was like one more month, and then it was like, <sighs> it was like three weeks, and two weeks, and one week, like seven more days. And then like you're, the last day of school, and the teacher is droning, and you're watching the clock, and you're just waiting to run. Who knows what I'm talking about, because of your hands. Yeah, that's the whole first half of the Bible waiting for Jesus. <laughs> There's just like a couple thousand years where they're like, come on, you got to come to earth. You got to fix this. You got to solve this thing. And, there w- and there's 300 different prophecies about him showing up. And what we're going to do is we're just going to take a couple minutes after I pray. And I'm going to give you 10 of them just to give you evidence that this thing that we call the Bible is true. And that every time God makes a prediction, it always comes to pass. Come on, say God's prophecies always come true. They never fail. Which means something. If the 300 prophecies for his first coming came to pass, there's more prophecies about his second coming. There's even more in the second half of the Bible about his second coming, which means, oh, he's not coming back. Oh yeah, if he fulfilled the first one, he's going to fulfill the second one. And someday you're going to see Christ return in the sky and transform the world. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm just going to talk to you about 10 prophecies, just 10. 
in the Old Testament that came to pass out of the 300. Just to show you how, how specific these prophecies are and that nobody could make this up and they can't accidentally happen. Unless there's somebody orchestrating it behind the scenes, unless God's doing it, they never would have happened. I'll pray and I'll show you this stuff. Lord Jesus, pray that every life, as we look at the Christmas story over the next four weeks and at your prophecies coming to pass, that you are who you say you are, that when you speak, it always happened. You never fail us. I pray that as we look at your word, as we look at these texts, that we would understand how clear it is that you are coming again as well. May we trust you. We seek you. Everybody say, my heart's open. My mind's ready. Make me better, God. Transform me with your word. Lead me now, Jesus. All God's people said, amen. You ready to do it? Okay, so buckle up. We're going to go through 10 prophecies that have already been fulfilled about the first coming of Christ, about, about the Christmas story, and about his early life. So prophecy number one is already on the screen. Somewhere around 4,000 to 6,000 B.C., which would be somewhere around 8,000 years ago, whenever the creation of the world was, whenever God spoke existence into being, and he created the first people, he created Adam, and then he creates Eve, then Adam and Eve eat the fruit because of this serpent who talked them into it. And they eat this fruit, and so God comes down, and he's like, all right, I got to put some consequences down to this whole deal. And he gives Adam and Eve some consequences, but then he turns to the serpent, and here's what he says to this, this serpent after they've eaten the fruit. I will put enmity, or I will cause an enemy to happen between humanity and the serpent, between the devil and the people of God. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head. Talking about Jesus coming someday, and you will strike his heel. Someday, there's gonna be somebody, some woman is gonna birth someone who's gonna conquer the devil. Someday, 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 someday. That's Adam and Eve are told this 8,000 years, like, like, like probably 4,000 years before Jesus ever comes to earth, maybe 8,000 years ago from now. They're like, someday somebody's coming, someday somebody's coming. And then Jesus shows up and if you ever watch the Passion of the Christ, Jesus is praying in the garden and this serpent slithers by and Jesus, playing, played by Jim Caviezel, goes boom! And he crushes the head of the snake right before he goes to the cross. But that serpent also gets to strike his heel or deeply wounds Jesus in the process. And that's just a prediction years before it ever happened that someday a savior's coming, he's gonna be wounded, but he's gonna conquer evil. Is that cool? Now, here's another prophecy. This is in about 2000 BC. The savior has to be Jewish, can't be any other nationality from the line of Abraham. Uh, This is God talking to Abraham in Genesis 12, verse three. He says, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through, what's the last word? All the nations of earth, everybody on planet earth is going to be blessed through one nationality, through Abraham and his offspring. And that would be Jesus coming to earth. Like the, the, the only, only person who's ever blessed the whole earth will be Christ. A third prophecy, seven, now we're in 700 BC, 700 years before Jesus, the Savior uh, will be born in Bethlehem. He couldn't have been born uh, in Elk River. Couldn't have been born in Nova Scotia. Couldn't have been born in Russia. Had to be born in the city of Bethlehem. And if he was not born in Bethlehem, he couldn't be the savior. It's not an accident where Christ was born. In fact, 700 years before he's ever born, this is what the prophet Isaiah says. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. Whoa, what? Sorry, I read the wrong verse. Micah chapter five, verse two. Sorry, I jumped ahead. Uh, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrath, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Somebody's going to come, be born in Bethlehem, and they have already lived before. Meaning, he's always lived He's never, he's never not existed. Like the, the self-existent God himself is gonna get born in this town called Bethlehem. And this is predicted 700 years before his birth. Number four, 700 BC, the Savior has to be born of a virgin. Like you couldn't, have, like it can't just be, nobody could be the Savior unless they were virgin born. That pretty much excludes most of the population most of the time. <laughs> Would you not agree? Yeah, you gotta have something real special for a lady to be like, hey, don't know how this happened, but... Uh, Hi. This is uh, Isaiah 7:14. Therefore, 
The Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him, what's the last word? Which means God with us. So a virgin's going to conceive and have a kid, and it's going to be God in the flesh. This is 700 years before Jesus is ever born. This is predicted. Now we're in 500 B.C. Now I'm going to kind of shift gears instead of talking about just about his birth, but about his life. The Savior had to be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, and the money had to be thrown to the potter. What? What? Yeah, yeah. So Judas betrays Jesus. Almost everybody knows that. Judas betrays Jesus. Do you know he had to do it for 30 pieces of silver? If he did it for 29, he couldn't, Jesus couldn't have been God? Had to be 30 pieces of silver. Couldn't be anything else. And the, a- afterwards, the money had to be thrown to a potter. What does that even mean? I'll give you a couple verses about it. So this is the New Testament. Well, first of all, let me read the Old Testament verses. Zechariah 11. It says, and I say to them, if you, like, if you like, give me my wages, whatever they are worth, but only if you want to. So they counted out my wages, 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter. Whoa, that magnificent sum for which, which they have valued me. So I took the 30 coins and threw it to the potter. And then the last phrase is really interesting. In the temple of the Lord. Weird. Now look at the New Testament. This is 500 BC. This is pretty good. 500 years before it ever happens. Matthew 26, 15. How much will you pay me to betray Jesus? And they gave him 30 pieces of silver. Wait, what? Now, I'll give you another verse. Matthew 27, verse 5. So Judas threw the money into the temple. Where where did they say the money had to get thrown? Back into the temple. Huh. Then he went away and hanged himself, and the chief priest picked up the coins. It is not, it is against the law to put this in the treasury, says it's blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field. That can't be coincidence. As the burial place for foreigners. That's 500 years before it ever happens. I'll give you another 700-year-old prophecy before the birth of Christ. The, the Savior had to be beaten, he had to be spit on, and he had to be mocked. If he hadn't been beaten and spit on and mocked, he couldn't be the Savior. Isaiah 50, verse 6, I offer my back to those who beat me and my cheeks to those. This is 700 years before it ever happens. I'm going to offer my back to those who beat me and my cheeks to those who pull out my beard. I, I, I did not hide my face from mockery and spitting. Mark 10, 33 and 34, the Son of Man will be delivered over to the the chief priests and scribes. They will condemn him to death and will deliver him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And then three days later, he's going to rise again. Jesus is already telling him it's going to happen before it even happens. So by the way, you you realize he's like, hey, they're going to do this to me and then I'm just going to get back up. He even tells, he's gonna, he says he's going to resurrect after three days. How can somebody predict the exact amount of time they're going to be dead and resurrect? And yet Christ does. Number eight, and this is, this is my favorite one. This is a thousand years before the birth of Jesus. And probably, actually, let's do number seven first, and then we'll do eight, number eight. Because I'm jumping ahead again. Is that my second time? Maybe I had too much coffee. Number, number seven, 700 BC. The Savior will not open his mouth. Isaiah 53, verse seven. He will be oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. Wait, what? When at Christ's trial, did he ever speak? He just let them say what they want. 700 years in advance. But number eight is my favorite. 1050 BC. The Savior will be crucified. Here's what's crazy. Crucifixion is not even invented until three or 400 BC. The Bible predicts in 1050 BC, somebody's going to come again. He's going to be the Savior, and they're going to pierce his hands and feet. And crucifixion hasn't even been invented yet. Nobody even thinks of it for another 700 years in human history. In fact, here's the verse. This is Psalm 22, verse 16. My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. An evil gang closes in on me. They have pierced my what? A thousand years before he ever dies. It is predicted exactly. Do you know, by the way, that that same psalm, Psalm 22, is the same chapter, the the psalm starts with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's what Jesus says at the cross. It's unbelievable. Every time God has a prophecy, bam, they just always come to pass. This This is Matthew 20. Behold, this is Jesus talking again. We're going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify, and the third day 
he's going to rise again. Like he's so predicting all of these details. We'll even go further. This one, this, this one blew my mind. Number nine, 1050 BC, the Savior's clothing had to be stolen and they had to be gambled over. So when Jesus got arrested, somebody had to take his clothes and start gambling for who gets them, otherwise he's not the Savior. You can't fake that stuff. He can't like, I think I want to be the Savior, so hey, here's my clothes, gamble over them while I'm dying. You can't fake this. Matthew twenty two sixteen. 16, my enemies, sorry, uh, they divided my garments among themselves and they threw dice for my clothing. Matthew 20, 27, 35, after they nailed him to the cross, the soldiers gambled for his clothing by throwing dice. What? This can't happen by accident. Number 10, 700 BC, he would die with the wicked and be buried with the rich. Wait, what? So not only was he gonna die but, and get crucified, but he had to die with other wicked men. And then he had to be buried with the rich. Otherwise, once again, not the savior. Huh. Isaiah 53 verse nine, he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich at his death. Matthew 27, 38, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. So he gets killed with wicked men. Matthew 27, 57, now when evening had come and there was, there was a rich man from Arimathea named jo jo Joseph, who himself was also a disciple of Christ. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large st stone against the door of the tomb. So he gets buried in the rich guy's tomb exactly as it's predicted. Oh, how long ago was that supposed to be? Yes, 700 years before it ever happens. He gets buried in the exact, you can't manipulate that stuff. You're dead at that point. I just gave you 10 prophecies on Jesus. There are 300 of them that got fulfilled exactly as he said he was gonna come, exactly down to the detail. And they go back from, they go back all the way from like, like I said, four, five, 6,000 BC, all the way up till his life, all the way through. And if he had failed at one, he wasn't the savior, but he fulfills them all. In fact, this is kind of cool. Mathematician and ast astronomy professor, Peter Stoner has made the statement, the chances of just eight of the messianic or the Messiah prophecies coming true by sheer chance is one and whatever that number is. <laughs> if he could just do eight of them, the chances of it happening by accident is one and whatever that is. Just now to give you a visual on that, this is equivalent to covering the entire state of Texas in silver dollars, two feet deep. Now mark one silver dollar with an X and throw it somewhere in the pile of the entire state. Now let one blindfolded man walk across the state and randomly stop and reach down and pick up one silver dollar and on the very first try, pick up the one coin you marked with the X. That is the likelihood of one man fulfilling just eight of the 300 prophecies in the life of Jesus in the Bible. Yet Jesus didn't fulfill eight, he fulfilled all 300. He is the Messiah, he is the savior. When God promises something, it always comes to pass. Come on, say, my God's prophecies always come true. Here's the point of all of this. I just gave you 10 of 300 to just do eight. It's one in a gajillion chances. Here's the, here's the kind of the point. If all these prophecies were fulfilled, you can be sure Jesus is coming again. There are more prophecies about his next coming than there was about the last one. And the reason why the Bible gave you so many was so you wouldn't be like, ah, oh, it's never gonna happen. It's not really, he's like, he did that one and that one. How many times did I have to tell you? I told you 300 times he's coming again. <laughs> when you let it sink in your skull, he's gonna show back up. In fact, I just wanna give you a small sampling of the prophecies about Christ's return. And now I'm just gonna take a few extra minutes. I'm gonna do these a little slower. I want you to catch the reality of, come on, say Jesus is coming soon. Five prophecies. Number one, he will come to save those who eagerly wait for him. There is a prophecy that specifically says he is coming for those who are paying attention and waiting versus those who are like, meh, I don't really care. Cool, good for him, I gotta go to work. 
Those that he's paying attention, this, this is the scripture verse on this. This is Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a what? Not to deal with your sin, because he already dealt with your sin at the cross, but to save those who are what? Eagerly, Eagerly waiting for him. So you have to kind of ask yourself the question, do you want his return? Now, I remember being a kid and be like, dude, we, we, had, we, we didn't have Valley Fair, we had Adventureland in, in, in our city. It's like a mini version of Valley Fair um, in the little town I grew up in. So like, and I, and I remember, I, I gotta go to Valley, I, I gotta go to Valley, think of it like Valley Fair. I gotta go to Valley Fair on Saturday. Please don't come back yet. <laughs> because in my head, my greatest thought was so childish, was don't fix the world, just let me go to Valley Fair. Now think about humans today. Think about adults who are like, please don't come back yet. I need to. You got an idol problem. You got a worship problem. You got something you want more than the Savior coming to fix this screwed up planet. And what he's saying is, you are to eagerly anticipate his return. Come on, Jesus, make it today. Come, Lord Jesus, now. Can you please fix this? I hate this broken world. It's so screwed up, and I'm so, I'm so tired of this. Can you please fix this thing? This is how Christians are to anticipate every day of their life. Like they're on the edge of their seats. Come on, God, you got to come back. And if there's something you would rather have, if there's something you would, oh, but I, but God, I really need my business to go before you come back because I really need to make sure that I get salesman of the year. <laughs> Jesus is like, you got, <laughs> that's your highest goal, salesman of the year? You don't think there's like problems in the Middle East and a virus going on and like, I don't know, there's like stuff. <laughs> but think about how, what C.S. Lewis said was, human beings are like children. And they'd rather play with mud pies in their backyard when their parents have offered them a week vacation at the beach. We are so easily satisfied with stupid stuff, guys. <laughs> we want things that are not even that important and not even that relevant. And there's so much greater, like we gotta be like, come on, God, you gotta come back. Because if you fix this place, we would have no more fear and no more disease and no more death and no more pain and no more divorce and no more using. Everything gets fixed if he just shows back up. And I'm sure you'll get to go to Valley Fair too. Are you with me? So you gotta ask the question, when you think about your heart, what do you want most? Is it Christ's return or do you want something else? And if you want something else, you have an idol, you have a false God. You gotta get rid of that and go back to worshiping the Savior. Second, second prophecy about his return. He will visibly return, not theoretically returned, just as he visibly left. Sometimes people say, oh yeah, you know, Jesus shows up again, he shows up in our hearts. And it's true, the Spirit of God is in you. <laughs> but when Jesus comes along, back to this planet, everything gets solved. And we are waiting for that moment, just like he physically left. He didn't physically or th theoretically rise again. He physically rose again. He pushed over a tombstone, or a rock, walked out physically alive. They poked fingers in his, his nail holes in his hands and in his side. He physically ate food. He was alive and is still alive right now someplace. He is physically alive. When he left them, he said, hey, I'm going up to heaven. I'm giving this mission to you to save the world. I gotta go. And then he floated up. Well, what do you mean? I've been to the spot in Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives. That was the last spot where Jesus stood. And we took pictures of this little square space where we believe that they've just kind of cordoned it off and said this was when he left us. And he physically went up. In fact, this is the scripture. Now when he has spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. This is on the Mount of Olives. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, 
Behold, two men stood by in white apparel uh, who also said, men of Galilee, why are you looking up into the heaven? And then this is awesome. This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in like manner as you saw him go. Which means the same way he went up is the same way he's coming back. In fact, the scriptures and other prophecies says when you see him in the sky, he will land again on the Mount of Olives to the same spot. Why? Because the same place, the same way he went up, same place he's going to come back. He's going to land on the Mount of Olives. He's going to walk down the hill, which is the same road he rode a donkey into Jerusalem the first time he was here. He's going to walk down this road and up through a gate called the Eastern Gate. And he's going to sit on the throne of his father, David, in the city of Jerusalem. And he's going to rule and reign forever and evermore. That is what is going to happen. We are looking for a physical savior to physically return and physically save the world. Not theoretical. He is coming again to this planet like he was here the first time. He's coming the second time, but this time he's opening up a can. That makes me happy. Third prophecy. He will resurrect the dead believers first and then take the living believers to meet him in the air. Now, before we read the scripture, I wanna give you the thought. So the scripture says that he shows up in the air first, just like he went up in the air, he's gonna show up in the air. And all the dead believers that have already passed away will immediately resurrect with fully functioning bodies and meet him in the air. He is physically alive and they will physically be alive. So every person that you love that loves Jesus, that has passed, is physically going to be restored. We talked last week about Jesus restoring uh, 10 leprous men. He's gonna restore millions of people that, have, that are gone ahead of us that we love so much. And suddenly their hands are gonna work again and their Eyes are going to work again, and their facial features are going to come back. Not, they're not souls drifting around. They are physically returning to meet Jesus in the air. When Jesus returned, all those that have died that love Jesus return to meet him in the, in the air with physical bodies. And then secondarily, you who are alive on earth at that moment also meet him in the air. Why? Because he needs an army. If you read Revelation 19, y'all get white horses, and then he opens up his mouth and a sharp sword comes out which he strikes down the nations and he destroys the Antichrist and there's a final mega battle and the enemy is wiped out and all we are doing is kind of along for the show. We're like, yay, Jesus. God, I didn't have to fight that, but I'm with you. <laughs> Here's the verse on this. First Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the, the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ, those that you love that have already passed away, <laughs> will rise first. Then those who are alive and who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. So this is the part of that prophecy that we are looking for now. Like right now, literally, Jesus could show back up in the sky and be like, hey, I'm calling my church home. And before we even get there, everybody that has ever died in all of Christianity will resurrect in that moment and be with Christ before we could even get there. And then secondarily, we're going to. And we meet Christ in the air. Now, when that's gonna occur, when it is, and what will happen? Soon. Yeah. Oh, people are like, yeah, people been saying it's going to be soon for like 2,000 years. And I just always like, yeah, that's because God's patient and he likes it. You better turn now because he's giving you a little more time. Don't tell me he ain't coming back. He just likes you enough to give you a little more chance because eventually that time runs out and there is no more chance. And then the end is here. When people ask me, do you think we're closer to the end than we used to be? Well, of course we are. <laughs> <laughs> Duh. 
When's it going to happen? I, this, is, this is just my own, I don't, I don't have any idea, of course. The scripture actually says don't, don't try to predict the times, only God knows. But here's what I always tell people. I believe it could happen in my lifetime. I believe we are in the last harvest of souls. I think we are in the last season where God is offering people a chance to turn to him and follow him. And then he's going to come back. And I fully anticipate to see it in my lifetime. I don't think it's crazy. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I would say the opposite. To not consider the fact that eternity might be real would be really foolish on your part since you're only going to live to be about 75. If eternity is even slightly real, oh, I don't believe in eternity. Well, really? Well, even if it's slightly real, it, like, let's just may, maybe, just, maybe there's a 1%, even if it's possible at all, you might want to think about what you'd want to do for, you know, like a billion years versus 75. Are you with me? And so this, this conversation, do you know that there's pretty much no greater conversation in the New Testament, like the, like the majority theme is around his return? Almost every book of the Bible in the New Testament is like, he's coming back, he's coming back, he's coming back, he's coming back, he's coming, it's like over and over and over and over and over again. And when we stop thinking he's returning and we stop paying attention and we stop eagerly waiting for him, this is when our lives start to crumble. We pay attention to lesser things and we get caught up in false gods and much of our destruction comes from wanting something now versus just wanting the Savior. Are you with me? Yeah. Number four, number four. He will return when the world is as evil as it was in the days of Noah. Now, this is pretty interesting. So when Jesus predicted his return, he says, this is what he said, this is what he says, this is, let me read the book of Genesis first. So this is Genesis. This is when Noah and the flood happened years ago. This is why God destroyed the world with the flood. This is, this is Genesis five, 6 verse 5. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth and saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry that he had made them and put them on the earth and it broke his heart and then he sent a flood. And it goes from there. So, the reason why God judged the world the first time was he looked at humanity and he was like, you guys are really, I don't even know how to describe this. You got nothing positive. And there's only one guy on the planet with anything positive going on and that's Noah. And so God rescues one family and starts over. This is what he says about his second coming. When the Son of Man returns, is Jesus talking about his own return? It will be like it was in Noah's day. Where every time you use the internet, it's all porn and nasty comments and hate speech and evil. And every time there's a news story, just read the comments, they're always as corrupt as they can be. And it's like, what's wrong with humanity? Why can't we find a bright spot anywhere? When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day, in those days before the flood, but people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up until the time that Noah entered his boat. They were like, yeah, let's just party because whatever, it doesn't really matter, super corrupt. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. This is what it will be like when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women grinding flour in the mill. One taken, the other left. So you two must keep watch, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Because it's going to look like every other day. And don't you look at your world and go, man, this thing's screwed up. Who would agree with that? Can I get an amen? amen? That's a horrible amen, isn't it? <laughs> Yay, it's screwed up. But we all know it is. We're like, man, why is everything so dysfunctional? Yeah. And it's because Christ, Christ's prophecy is the closer you get to my return, the more dysfunctional and broken everything is. 
And I look at our world and go, we're pretty dang close to the age of Noah. Yeah. Now, I'll even take it further. If there's this moment when he pulls Christians out of the world. So he's going to take up those who are already believers off the planet. Then everybody left would be unbelievers, yes or no? Would that make the thoughts of their hearts continually evil all the time? Yes or no? Oh, yeah. So the only positive, people are like, yeah, but there's still a church here, and the church is still anticipating Christ's return. Yeah, but he already knows we're on the winning team. He's not really looking at our hearts right now. He already saved us. And so as he looks at the world and he looks at the global population and he looks at humanity, when all he's got left is believers and there's just nothing else, he's like, I got to take them out and then we're going to judge the world. Just like he rescued Noah and then judged the world. This should give you some, some uh, flow, some security if you're a follower of Jesus. Just like he rescued Noah. He's going to rescue me. Just like he rescued Noah before the flood hit. He's going to rescue me. There's going to be judgment someday and he's going to fix this whole thing and solve this whole thing. But, but man, he's going he's to pull me from it. And you, as a follower of God, get saved from wrath and saved from destruction. Number five, are you still with me? Merry Christmas. <laughs> this is the best Christmas sermon ever. You are between two Advents. There was a first Advent. All those prophecies came to pass. There is a second advent. It is coming soon. God's like, come on, get ready. Anticipate my arrival because when I show up. Number five, he will come unexpectedly, so be ready. So just like nobody noticed when he came the first time, you got to understand, man, think about it. Nobody noticed. The only reason why they ended up in Bethlehem, they didn't even live in Bethlehem. They lived in Nazareth, but they had to go to Bethlehem because they had to pay their taxes there. So God orchestrated it. So they ended up in Bethlehem to pay their taxes. He's like, all right, now you can have, have Jesus. So then, he, but nobody notices. I want you to understand that at his return, few are gonna notice. And those that are expectantly waiting his return, we're gonna go. And then what follows, it's really rough. But here's what I gotta tell you. The emphasis isn't on what's really rough. The emphasis is on you get rescued if you just walk with Jesus. The emphasis is on rescue. The emphasis is on mercy. The emphasis is on grace. The emphasis is, come on, I can get you, pull you from this. I've got something so much better for you. While the world is all falling apart, I can still take you someplace good, but you gotta reject the ways of the world and you gotta walk with the Savior and you gotta trust that that Savior's coming back because if you walk with the Savior, you're gonna elevate your thinking and you're gonna elevate your life and then you're gonna live a life that's decent and then when Christ returns, you're gonna be like, yeah! And you walk into eternity having done all that you could to honor your Savior. This is 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 through 6. And by the way, we're going to go more in depth with this the Saturday and Sunday after Christmas Eve. So this is kind of like part one of the sermon that I'm going to actually pick back up. The Saturday and Sunday after Christmas Eve. So Christmas Eve service will also happen here. And then that Saturday and Sunday, we're going to spend the whole entire service just around on, on, on his return prophecies and what it's going to look like and what's going on on the planet. And anyway, but this is the last verse I can give you on this. For you know quite well, the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly. Everybody say unexpectedly. Like a thief in the night. When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin. And there will be no escape. But you aren't in the dark about these things. Come on, say, I'm not in the dark. <laughs> Dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day comes, the Lord comes like a thief. Come on, say, I'm not going to be surprised. <laughs> For you are children of the light. Come on, say, I'm a child of the light. And of the day, and you don't belong to the darkness and to the night. Just like we looked at that story of Candy earlier and God rescued her from her dysfunction in that video and all of a sudden she couldn't get high anymore. 
A, children, a child of darkness is suddenly brought into the light and he could, she just couldn't go back to her former ways. For you, are ch- for you are children of the light and of the day and you don't belong to the darkness and of the night. So be on your guard. Not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be what? So there are basically what he's basically saying in this verse is there are basically two groups of people in our world. One group that is asleep and they just couldn't care less. And there's another group that is alert and wide awake and they are actively anticipating Christ's return. And you have to ask yourself a couple questions. First question I would ask you is, are you ready to meet the coming savior? Are you personally ready? Because you will give account to the one who created you. You're gonna give account to him. Revelation 22, 12, the very last thing he says in the Bible, behold, I'm coming soon. It's the very last thing he says. When you think about your life and your heart and your story and your situation, are, are you ready to meet him? If he's gonna show back up right now, this day, like he's not even gonna wait till this Christmas. He's like, dude, let's get this over with. Tired of all this, here we go, boom. And he ended it all. Are you going up? Have you made peace in your heart and in your life that he is savior and Lord and ruler over all? Or like I said earlier, are you one of those people who you have, you're like, can you just wait a little longer because I have something else I gotta do? I, I, I would suggest that a false savior, uh, you, by the way, um, you winning businessman of the year is, is not gonna save you on judgment day. <laughs> Hey, but I won businessman of the year. He's like, what? (laughs) Oh, but I really want to get married. He's like, a spouse on judgment day that they don't get you into heaven. Oh, but I made all this money. See all the money I made? He's like, I don't care, bro. You can even give me credit cards. It's not going to bribe me. At the end of the day, you're going to stand before Christ, you and him. And he's gonna say, did you give your heart to me? Did you give your life to me? Or did you anticipate my arrival? Were you expecting me to show up? And were you so excited that, you might, that I might come today? What's, what's your story? What's your heart say? If you're not ready and excited about his return, then I would suggest that maybe today could be a change of heart. Yes. Maybe right now you would let Christ rescue you like he has rescued so many of us. And you could just pray a simple prayer. In fact, I'm gonna invite you guys to close your eyes and bow your head. And I'm gonna lead us in a prayer. And this prayer is, it's a rejection of the world. It is a rejection of following and loving lesser things. And it's a reminder that we just worship Jesus and we follow Jesus and we love Jesus and we anticipate his return. And right now, if you know you gotta pray a prayer like that, I just want you to pray it out with me. Just All together, just say, Jesus Christ, thank you that you are coming again. Forgive me for not paying attention. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for loving me. Take me to heaven when I die. I'm excited to meet you in the air. Come, Lord Jesus. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. amen. So before we go to the second question, don't put that on the screen yet. I just, there's two questions. The first question is, are you ready to meet him? But part of that meeting him is identifying with him. So it's gonna be apparently obvious like what Christians went to heaven because the world's gonna be like, hey, there's a bunch of people gone. (laughs) They're the ones that must've loved. They're, They're gonna recognize it. They're gonna know who identified with Jesus. But do you realize that he asks you to identify with him now before you go there? He says, if you identify with me publicly on earth, I identify you before my Father in heaven. And that's what baptism is. That's, that's a, a moment where you stand up in front of other people and you're like, I just want everybody to know, I'm not going my own way anymore. My old way is dying and dead and gone. And so you go down underneath the water and say, this life is done. And then you come back up from the water like you're gonna either rise again if you pass away at Christ's return or... You're gonna rise again like you're gonna go to meet him someday in the air. 
but it is a self-identifying moment with saying, I just follow Jesus and he alone resurrects people and he's gonna resurrect me. So here's my challenge this Christmas season before you leave tonight. Get baptized, get baptized, get baptized, get baptized. Pastor Ruben's gonna be sitting right here on the front of the stage. It's his, it's his privilege to baptize people. We've got shorts, shirts, towels, chlorinated water. If you're watching online and you're like, man, I never thought about baptism that way before. Well, I tell you, come in tomorrow for one of the services, come over here tonight still, drive over and we'll baptize you. And the truth of the matter is, as you identify with the Savior, it builds your faith. It strengthens your step so that when you go back out in the world, you have the ability to stay strong when everybody else starts to mock. Because remember, Noah in Noah's day, everybody thought Noah was an idiot. So as a follower of Jesus and you walk back out there in the world, you're like, you know how hard it is to like stand strong in the face of so much oppression. And baptism helps strengthen you so that you can live that out. If you've never been baptized, I challenge you to come talk to Pastor Ruben as soon as service is over. Last question I have for you tonight, who are you gonna tell about Jesus and his imminent return? Come on, say, who are you gonna tell? So, yeah, I know, I know it's uh, COVID. Oh, I know that some people don't wanna go to church and like, this, this, church is irrelevant like right now in the moment. This, that, I'm not asking a church question. What I'm asking is the relevance of more people are considering eternity right now than have ever considered it in your entire lifetime. More people are thinking about their own mortality than ever before because it's constantly on the news all day, every day, all day, every day. And so people are thinking about like, oh, what, like okay, how, how long am I gonna live and what's my future gonna look like? And they're actually thinking about eternity now more than they ever have in their whole life. So who are you gonna tell this week? Who are you gonna talk to about faith? Who are you gonna share Christ with? Who are you gonna say, hey, I'm not worried about our world because Jesus is gonna fix it. Come on, say, who will I tell? Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, I pray that people get baptized tonight. I pray that people reaffirm their commitment to worship you and follow you and love you because you are returning and you're coming to rescue us. And that's awesome. I pray right now that you would give them the courage to go out like Noah and share their faith with others in the face of opposition. As a culture crumbles, may they stand strong like Elijah did, like Daniel did, like Esther did, like the Apostle Paul, and most importantly, like you, Jesus. May you strengthen our hearts and our weak knees. May you help us hold our head up high. May you give, a, give boldness to our voices and strength to our step and love for the world. And then we ask you to use us. Come on, say, use me. Use us to transform somebody else. Help us rescue one more life and lead them to the Savior. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. amen.